Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show on a Tuesday, joined by Dr. John Bergsma, returning guest, and he is going to go over the reliability of the Old Testament, which I'm really excited about. I love the Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament guy, and there's just not enough stuff out there on the Old Testament. So really excited to have you on, Dr. Bergsma. How how you been? I've been great, Michael. Just really busy. Start of the semester, trying to uh, take care of uh, family and uh, hundreds of students and um, responsibilities at St. Paul Center and get some time for writing in there too. So <laughs> how do you a lot of balls in the air. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, how do you... I don't really manage it. So. <laughs> yeah, with all that going on, it, it's pretty hard to write. I mean, at least yeah. in my experience. So I, I can yeah. I can certainly sympathize. I can only imagine Definitely. your case though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have actually a, a book on the Old Testament that you've already written. I think uh, co co-authored with Dr. Petrie on the Old Testament. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, a Catholic introduction to the Bible, Old Testament. Um, it's a big, big book, four pound mm. book, <laughs> four pounds, four inches, something like that. Um, uh, with the Ignatius Press. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it was a it was our baby. We. We thought it up, um, you know, back, gosh, now, what it would, what would that be? That'd be like, uh, you know, 15 years ago, we were at a Society oh, wow. of Biblical Literature meeting and we were rooming together and we were just talking about how at Protestant seminaries, um, they get big books on, on the Torah or big books on the prophets for their classes. And uh, at Catholic seminaries, you get a little trade paperback that covers all your courses in Old Testament. And so this, this isn't right. We should really give uh, Catholic seminarians um, a, a similar resolution treatment of the scriptures to what their Protestant um, colleagues are getting. And, and the fruit of that effort was that Catholic introduction to the Bible Old Testament from Ignatius. And we're working on the New Testament sequel to that. Uh, Dr. Petrie has probably 85% uh, of that drafted already. Um, it just got, he's got, just got to make that final push over the goal line, and then we can begin the editorial process on the New Testament volume. Wow, that's exciting. So yeah, New really Testament is. coming out. Wow. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. uh, definitely looking forward to that. But, um, you know, let's talk a little bit here about the Old Testament. One question that a lot of people tend to have when it comes to the Old Testament is, well, something like the book of Genesis. Is this real history? Is it mythology? Is it a combination of both? Where, where do we land on this as Catholics? Sure. Well, you know, is it history is a broad question. Um not not everything in the book of Genesis uh, is of a historical genre. I mean, we've got poetry uh, in there um, and especially the first 11 chapters. Uh, I would they're not history writing in 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 our modern sense. It's more uh, I would regard it more as a kind of worldview building narratives. We don't have like a very succinct term for that. But what we find in the first 11 chapters is we we build an entire view of the world in, in deft, succinct strokes. Like this is the framework to think about reality. Um, but uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be evasive either. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we could phrase it this way. Does Genesis contain historical information? Absolutely. Uh, does it? Does Genesis relate to real per, real persons in space time who um who are we are related to etc yes absolutely and especially from chapter 12 on uh can we place the events of genesis into known historical contexts and yes absolutely um there's several places where we can make uh, uh synchronisms with mm. um with uh what we know of ancient Near Eastern history. So yes, uh, generally speaking, yes, uh, Genesis contains a great deal of historical information. Um, although most of it is a biography, yeah. I would say, like in terms of genre, you know, Genesis 12 to the end of the book is a kind of a cultural biography of um, cultural ancestors. Um, but these are real people living in uh, the you know present day land of Israel and the land of Egypt and et cetera. And um, yes, uh, these are, you know, space time individuals who really ate and breathed and lived and interacted, et cetera. 
One story that I heard you tell recently in another interview is where you went to the Society uh, for Biblical Literature and they had a uh, session that was talking about the historicity of Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you maybe walk us through that? Tell us a little bit about right. it. Right. Yeah. A number of years ago now, I'd, I'd, I'd have to look and, and locate the exact year, somewhere, somewhere between 2012 and 2016. I was at one of the Society of Biblical Literature conventions that was being held that year in San Francisco. And um, I wandered into a session because uh, I was a little bit bored, actually. I was looking for something interesting. I had this archaeology session. I'm always interested in archaeology. So I go into this archaeology session. I sit down. I'm listening. After about 45 minutes, I realized that the presenters uh, think that they have found Sodom and Gomorrah. OK, mm -hmm. biblical Sodom and Gomorrah. So really starting to pique my interest. So after the session was over and they opened up for q and I was the first one to raise my hand. And I asked uh, the presenter, who I later found out was an archaeologist by the name of Steve Collins. Um, I asked him, uh, so did you find any arrowheads? And uh, the reason I asked that is because when you're dealing with biblical archaeology or, or any ancient Near Eastern archaeology, you have these things called destruction layers where these cities are destroyed because most cities have a lifespan and they, they end up getting destroyed at some point by somebody or something. And uh, if it's destroyed in battle, then you get arrowheads from the attacking army. So that's a telltale sign that your city was wiped out by, you know, human warfare. If you don't find arrowheads, then you got some kind of natural disaster going on. So again, I asked, well, did you find any arrowheads? And he knew what I was getting at. And uh, he responded by saying, well, you know, I didn't really want to go there uh, on the record, but all I'm going to say right now is that it appears to have been destroyed in a heat event. <laughs> 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 I'm like, I'm like, there's like 20 other people and myself, you know, in this kind of sleepy session that wasn't widely advertised. And we're like looking at each other, like, what's he talking about? What's a heat event? Is that like a wardrobe malfunction? You know, kind of, what kind of euphemism is this? You know? So, okay. So he ended the session. They stopped all the recording devices and stuff like that. And so we, we all rushed him at the, at the front of the room. We're like, okay, cut the crap and just tell us what you found. And so uh, Dr. Collins started to explain. It's like, okay, we, we got down to the destruction layer of these mounds which we were coming to believe were sodom and gomorrah and uh we we pulled out this piece of pottery and on one side it was glazed and he said my heart sank because uh when i saw that glazing i thought oh our site is contaminated and the reason for that is that um pottery glazing of this sort uh didn't become common in the in the near east until the ottoman period which is like ad 1000 you know so mm -hmm. you know thousands of years later mm -hmm. so and we're, we're talking about a, a bronze age excavation right so so it's hard to say we saw this glazing but then he turned the the pottery shard over and on the other side it was clearly late bronze age pottery but it's got this glazing which is anachronistic you know so long story short, he sent it to labs. I think it was Los Alamos, actually, that he sent it to. I could be wrong on that, but he sent it to some labs in, in, in the U.S. And the lab report co comes back and they say, well, this glazing that you've got in your pottery is trinitite. It's like, OK, well, what's trinitite? Well, trinitite is this kind of crystalline glass that you get when you set off an atomic bomb in the desert and it melts the glass underneath your explosion. It's created when you raise um, silica containing sand to a, a, uh, a temperature of over 4000 degrees Fahrenheit, you mm -hmm. know, for at least a brief amount of time. So, they, again, the, the report comes back and says your your um, your pottery has been exposed to temperatures above 4000 degrees Fahrenheit for at least a couple of seconds, but not very long because it began to drip. You know, it melted the pottery into glass and it began to drip, but then it cooled quickly so a brief you know couple of seconds impact of you know more than four thousand degrees <laughs> you know so okay a lot long story short um you know they, they found a lot of evidence a, a lot of this glazing on on the surface they found uh human remains where you know the the skeleton was intact up until about halfway up the the spine and then just a scorch mark mm. um, because the Apparently, the person was standing behind a wall. So, 
the impact of the heat for the lower part was blocked by the wall. The upper part of the person was vaporized, okay, hmm. by this blast from, I, I believe it was about like 27 degrees above the horizon. So there are different theories. You know, some kind of meteor is what a lot of people propose, uh, similar to what happened in Tunguska, Siberia, where the whole, back in the, uh, I believe it was the 19th century, that like several hundred square miles of, of taiga or Siberian forest was, was blasted flat from what they believe is an incoming meteor. Um, so yeah, so this is absolutely astounding. So essentially though, uh, we have a, a, a reconstruction here that basically fits the biblical narrative in Genesis 19, you know, fire from the sky, destroying the largest cities in the region at this time. And Abraham was an eyewitness of this event. Absolutely sensational, of course, and astounding. Uh, Collins has gone on to written book, write books about this. You can get on Amazon, mm. type in Stephen Collins, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, his his work will pop up. But uh, you know, again, you know, Michael, this is a uh, an event. You know, I'm I'm a very you know raised in a conservative Christian home. You know, uh, in in a context in which the Bible was was treated as as true, mm -hmm. and even my, even I had like temptations on on this narrative. I was like, you know, this really sounds kind of fabulous. You know, could this mm -hmm. really have taken place? But uh, just just amazing to find archaeological verification, and then the fact that this is not transmitted in Mesopotamian chronicles or in the Egyptian chronicles, mm -hmm. but only in the biblical tradition, is this you know really astounding event, which which would have had socio political ramifications in, you know the. Uh, the uh, first half of the second millennium uh, BC throughout the, the region of the ancient Near East, you know, again, only recorded in the, in the biblical narratives. Absolutely amazing. What, why do you think it wasn't recorded by others? I mean, if this event was so significant, why didn't they document it? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I don't, I don't have the definitive answer for that. It may have been that uh, it took place in a time where Egypt and Mesopotamia, which were the major, uh, cradles of civilization at that point were were in turmoil or concerned with their interior with their internal affairs and, and not much concerned with what was taking place in Canaan, which is kind of mm -hmm. a borderland disputed between those two great uh, empires, uh, something like that. I, I suspect, mm -hmm. or it just didn't fit um, the ideological narratives of those civilizations, and that's what you find that most ancient Near Eastern uh inscriptions history writing are are basically you know fake news it's it's <laughs> propaganda it's, they, they are the cnn and the new york times of their day it's like whatever whatever fits their political agenda is what they print and if it doesn't fit their political agenda then it doesn't go in i mean i, I think that if all if the only source that you had was the new york times you'd never know that the march for life takes place on an annual basis in washington dc you know, so um, it, it's mm. stuff like that. <clears throat> well, it's, it's so. a good point. You know, I, I kind of hear implied there in that discussion that you had with the archaeologist that he was a little hesitant to mention anything that would corroborate the biblical account. Is there in scholarship kind of a hesitancy to confirm the historicity of the Pentateuch? Yes, it, it depends on what circles you're dealing with. In some circles, that's really a, a, a politically unpopular thing to do. And there's like an allergy against, um, you know, attempts to verify the biblical record. You know, but on the other hand, there are some circles and some groups where there's this great eagerness, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, prove the Bible in every way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got a whole spectrum in between. And in Steve Collins's case, uh, he really felt like he had hit um, hit gold, so to speak. He had hit a real, uh, like a demonstrable, um, empirically uh, verifiable uh, body of evidence that was very much in congruence with the biblical narrative. And he didn't want to um, attract negative scholarly attention by too quickly putting out a sensational story mm -hmm. so i think he he actually handled the the situation very responsibly and he was very modest very careful and very slow in the release of his information because his intent was 
not simply to make a sensational movie and you know get a million bucks with a, a cinema contract contract he really wanted to convince the guild he wanted to convince other scholars that he had actually found this and um i i have you know utmost mm -hmm. esteem for him for doing it in that way because i think that really is the gold standard that it really is what you want to do is is try to convince other scholars and like shift the whole field and uh colin's approach is a much better way of doing that than saying you know even if you do have a good find, you run quickly to a book publisher or a, or a movie studio and try to cash in on what you've discovered. Uh, when you, if you, if you do that too quickly, it incites the envy of your fellow scholars, mm -hmm. and once they're envious of you, you're never going to convince That's them. That's it. Wow. <laughs> so. That's interesting. Well, let me ask you this. You know, one thing that I hear often is the subject of the reliability of the new testament text and its transmission however i don't hear a whole lot about the old testament's transmission i'm not saying that uh, people are saying it's unreliable or reliable i just don't hear a lot about it can you tell us a little bit about the reliability if it's reliable of the text of the old testament and its transmission yes yes that's a great question and um with the Old Testament is complicated since it's such a large body of literature. And when you go to talking about the reliability of the transmission, mm -hmm. um, you're going to vary from books like Genesis, which were transmitted very conservatively and, uh, and very accurately uh, because everybody revered the books of Moses, mm -hmm. to books like uh, Tobit or Judith that show more textual variation um, because uh, they were not as highly revered by everybody, okay? Yeah. Um, so you, you get a, a wide range of that. But I would say for the, um, the proto-canonical books of the Old Testament, and especially the central books um, that, uh, that establish most of the doctrines of Judaism, like Genesis, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, um, you, have a very, you have a very reliable... Uh, transmission process going on there. And what has helped us a lot in that regard is um, the data from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're a scholar, you know, scholars are very much into minutia and high resolution analysis. And so every single letter that's differed, even if the change of letter doesn't change the meaning at all, but that's a big deal to a lot of scholars. So when they compare the Dead Sea Scrolls to uh, our medieval uh, manuscripts like the Masoretic text, uh, like our earliest copies of the Masoretic text, which is the standard Jewish text, the standard Jewish Hebrew text that's chanted in the synagogue. Our oldest copies of that go back to about AD 900 or so, or AD 1000, right in that century, the uh, 10th century AD. The Dead Sea Scrolls are pre-Christian going back as early as, say, 250 BC. Okay, so about a millennia in between there. And just to cut to the chase, uh, Michael, there, there aren't significant differences for the most part between, you know, except in a couple of cases that we could talk about, but there, there aren't significant differences in the Hebrew text of the Dead Sea Scrolls versus the Masoretic text uh, or the, the standard Jewish text that we've always had and always mm -hmm. known about. Mm -hmm. And so it really verifies the reliability of transmission over that period of a millennia. And then we can even, you know, verify even earlier because uh, prophets like uh, Jeremiah and uh, Ezekiel, uh, whose books are written very clearly in like a sixth century BC dialect of Hebrew, we can verify that from historical linguistics and, you know, using inscriptions to trace how Hebrew changed over time. We can say, yeah, this is sixth century Hebrew here. So the book looks like it really is coming from the time period that it presents itself. And we find a lot of quotations and allusions in Ezekiel and Jeremiah to the books of Moses. And um, that indicates that the books of Moses were circulating in a, um, a written form. Uh, near the end of uh, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of David. And uh, the form that they were circulating in doesn't seem to be significantly different than the form that we have based on the allusions and quotations that we find in these sixth century prophets. So uh, the, the transmission process of the Old Testament uh, 
does indeed seem to be conservative. By that, I mean mm -hmm. the sense that people didn't go wild with it or add stuff or take away in a dramatic way. They were conservative and trying to write down what they had before them. And what also helps in this regard is like ancient translations like the um, the Septuagint, which were made in like the third century BC. And the Greek that we have for the most part looks like, yeah, this is a translation of the Hebrew text that we're familiar with. Hmm. Well, specifically about that, the, the Septuagint, mm -hmm. there are instances where I'll, I'll look at the Septuagint versus perhaps the Masoretic text. And you'll especially see this when engaging in apologetics with Jews. Um, right. Perhaps some of those Messianic passages, you, you'll see some significant differences there. Uh, can you maybe explain why, why do we see some differences with the Septuagint versus yeah. the Masoretic? No. Yeah, absolutely. We see some differences in the Septuagint because there were um, uh, slight variations in uh, the wording of the Hebrew originals. OK, and sometimes that's at play. Um, sometimes there is, you know, mistranslation into Greek. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the um, the Hebrew text is ambiguous and you can go in different translational directions with it. And uh, the ancient Greek translation translators went in one direction and maybe uh, modern Judaism would, would have preferred that they had gone in a different direction in terms of um, where you go. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a, a common problem, for example, is the word Elohim. Mm -hmm. in hebrew okay mm -hmm. it's a word for god but it also can mean gods it can mean heavenly beings um so frequently El elohim is translated in septuagint as angels um and uh but you know uh that's a that's a choice is is angels really what was intended there or should we mm -hmm. say god you know or gods or something like that and uh but you know every t every instance of translation involves a, a kind of choice about different possibilities and so um, those ancient Greek translators, you know, made those choices. And sometimes they were, you know, different than what we might, you know, argue for today or what the Jewish tradition might have settled down upon in terms of their, uh, their traditional interpretations. I would say on the same time, Michael, that uh, oftentimes for, for Messianic prophecy, there's many instances in which I prefer the Hebrew, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. You know, like Psalm 2, I, I prefer the Hebrew of Psalm 2 because the literal Hebrew at the end of um, Psalm 2 mm -hmm. uh, uh, commands the reader to um, uh, to kiss the son. OK, kiss the son of the son of God, who is the mm -hmm. Davidic king. And it comes out differently in uh, the Septuagint. I can't remember at the exact moment how this uh, winds up in the Septuagint, but it does not say kiss the sun. Hmm. But uh, I like that kiss the sun because read messianically, what it's talking about is showing honor or deference to the Messiah, to the anointed son of David, who is ultimately Christ. So hmm. the way it reads in the Hebrew lends itself even better to, hmm. you know, messianic interpretation than how it runs in the Septuagint. Very helpful. I've often wondered about some of these things, and uh, I, I knew you'd be the perfect person to ask, so I appreciate <laughs> that. Tell me a little bit about the Exodus story. You know, I encountered an atheist not long ago, and he's a former Catholic, um, now atheist. And one of the reasons is he says that, look, there's just no historical evidence for the Exodus. What, what would you say to somebody who feels that way? Yeah, I would say there's a ton of circumstantial evidence uh, for the exodus, and it's very difficult to explain um, why, uh, you know, virtually all of the um, different genre categories of the Old Testament are shot through with this conviction that God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, unless that actually took place, you know, mm -hmm. every brand, er, er, you know, every body of literature within the Old Testament, you know, continually re reflects back on this, um, you know, uh, or, uh, or uh, historical origination out mm -hmm. of Egypt and, and why make that up? And if it didn't take place, why don't the prophets or the wisdom literature or um, some of the major books, you know, adopt a different view of the origin of Israel? You know, some some view that gives us the truth. OK, so mm -hmm. it's just it's just pervasive in the Israelite tradition that they came up out of Egypt. Mm 
And then there's all kinds of circumstantial evidence. Now, what folks want is, is some inscription on a wall, on a, on a temple in Egypt that says, oh yeah, we lost all our Semitic slaves in the year or whatever. Well, that's never going to be reported in an Egyptian annal. They never admit any mistakes. I mean, if, if you all, all you had was the Egyptian side of events, then, you know, the Pharaoh never lost a battle and, you know, they never suffered a plague and et cetera. So they're, they're not going to record that. So if you're trying to look for that and if that's your standard for verification, it's not going to be found. But if you're looking for uh, contextual clues and circumstantial evidence, there's a ton there's all kinds of Egyptian loan words in the book of Exodus in those parts of the Pentateuch that treat with treat of this event. Uh, Moses, Aaron, uh, Aaron's sons, Phineas and Hur, they have Egyptian names. OK, mm -hmm. what are they doing with Egyptian names if they don't have some kind of connection to Egyptian culture? When mm -hmm. you when you look at the tabernacle, uh, which whose instructions are all given in the book of Exodus, they're clearly using uh, new kingdom Egyptian technology. There's technical terms for different architectural features of the tabernacle that compare well with uh, architectural terminology from Egyptian texts from this time period. In fact, there's certain features of the tabernacle that are really hard to understand if you're approaching it simply from a Hebrew perspective. But then if you read these Egyptian texts that describe how they made their sacred uh, artifacts and their sacred vessels, et cetera, it suddenly comes to light, especially uh, due to the fact that we have a lot of this Egyptian uh, uh, sacred vessels and, and cultic uh, furniture, et cetera, from, for example, the, the tomb of King Tut. So strikingly, there is a sacred ark that we recovered from King Tut's tomb that has uh, the god Anubis on top of it, but otherwise it's a gold box on poles, you know, huh. roughly, the, roughly the dimensions that were, uh, you know, given to described for the Ark of the Covenant. And then this has long been noticed, the, the pattern for the tabernacle where you have a rectangle of curtains that surround a sacred tent, and then that sacred tent is divided into two, an outer court and an inner court. And, uh, and then God is enthroned between two cherubim in the inner court. That would be the Ark of the Covenant and so on. This is very similar to the war tent of Ramses II. We have an ins we have a engraving of it in um, some Egyptian temples. And uh, long notice, basically the same uh, dimensions. And uh, Ramses would sit in the center behind a curtain in the inner uh, tent of, of his, uh, you know, war encampment uh, on a cherubim throne with a cherubim on either side. Hmm. So we went out, when I say that, it's it's so striking, okay, that, you know, there's a danger that folks would say, oh, well, you know, then the Bible is just copying from uh, Egyptian sources or something like this. But what, what I, the point I try to drive home with my students is, look, if God is going to communicate to these Israelites who have been brought out of Egypt, who have been living in Egyptian culture for 400 years, God is going to use language and cultural forms that communicate to them that they understand. And the Pharaoh was worshipped as a god, and he had this sacred tent that moved around with him. Now, if God's trying to teach the Israelites to worship him, you know, he's going to use something that they understand. They understand the concept of a movable sacred tent, but inside, it's not Pharaoh who's enthroned. It's the unseen God of Israel who's enthroned above the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so this makes sense. Again, if the Blessed Mother appeared to you or I, Michael, she would speak to us in English. She's mm -hmm. not going to speak to us in Swahili or Hebrew or something because we're not going to understand it. And likewise, when she appeared to Juan Diego, she used you know culturally appropriate forms that communicated back in Mexican culture at that time. And the same is true here. And just the the amount of, you know, the, the language, the cultural artifacts, um, the itinerary that we have recorded of like they're moving from one town to another uh, as they move out into the Sinai Peninsula, et cetera, that, you know, that I have an article from a, an Egyptologist about 15 years ago now who shows that this travel itinerary compares well with travelogues that we have 
uh, from this uh, New Kingdom period in Egypt, uh, you know, sequence of towns that you would move through. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to verify the Egyptian background of these artifacts, of the language, of the names, of the itinerary, unless this was based on a real event that took place roughly in the second half of the second millennia BC mm -hmm. in that territory between Egypt and what we now know of as the land of it, as the, the state of Israel. Wow. I have a couple follow-ups here. Um, number one, um, it, yeah, it, it does seem pretty clear that the Israelites were looking to things that were going on in the surrounding nations and taking the good that is found in them and using it for the glory of God and for uh, his kingdom. And you gave several examples. But when we look at scripture itself in the book of Exodus, it talks about how God pattern the tabernacle according to the one in heaven does the fact that the israelites are using things from older cultures actually undermine the text of scripture there or are they are they reconcilable are they harmonious no the, i totally believe they're reconcilable you know the um uh yeah according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain you know the, mm -hmm. the pattern shown in heaven so there is a a um a kind of uh, mythosymbolic um, structure of the tabernacle that's long been recognized where the features of the tabernacle also resemble aspects of the creation. So you, you see this going back all the way to the interpretation of the structure of the tabernacle that we see in Philo Judeus, um, the, the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher who is roughly a contemporary of St. Paul. He describes how the great basin of water represented the ocean and the, um, the lamps within the holy place uh, represented the visible planets uh, and um, you know, the, the lights of, of, uh, of the sky. You had the, a veil between the holy place and the holy of holies that was of dark blue color that was supposed to represent the cosmos and had the sun and the moon and stars embroidered on it. So there was this cosmic dimension. There's, there's this cosmic symbolism in the way that the tabernacle was constructed in order to evoke for the worshipers the concept that the tabernacle represented the universe and that the whole universe uh, is a temple for the worship of God. And um, that's a dimension of Genesis 1 and 2 that we wouldn't notice unless we compared Genesis 1 and 2 with other ancient Near Eastern literature. And then we see that some of the literary patterns of Genesis 1 and 2 resemble the literary pattern of temple building narratives from Mesopotamia and from Egypt. And so the, the theological message then is that when God builds the cosmos over the course of seven days, it's really a cosmic temple for the worship of God. And then this cosmic imagery, like the great basin of water and the lamps in the holy place and the veil, et cetera, that we find in the tabernacle show that the tabernacle is a kind of microcosm or a kind of navel of the universe where this uh, liturgical character of the cosmos is concentrated into uh, one localized place, and, and this is where you can go then and enter and commune with God and worship God and encounter God. So um, it, it's not an either or thing. Um, again, you know, God is, is using uh, cultural forms that can be understood by his people. Otherwise, you know, what's the point if, if we're constructing things that can't even be comprehended, you know, like a flying saucer, you know, is given to the Israelites as a place of where like, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to make sense. So there, but, but at the same time, it's communicating, um, you know, theological truth that is consistent with uh, God's revelation of himself from Genesis through Revelation. That's really helpful. It also makes sense of things in Matthew 24 that Jesus says, where it sounds like he's talking about the destruction of the macrocosm, when in reality, right. he's talking about the destruction of the microcosm, that yeah. is the temple in 70 AD. Right. And so yeah. that that helps a lot with that, especially in the New Testament, in my opinion. Um, you know, you, you, talking about the Exodus, one more question about it. Um, I think it was Dr. Michael Heiser that I was listening to a while back, and he was saying, well, it's 
this isn't necessarily a play by play description of how it went, because, you know, in this chapter, Moses is actually supposed to be here. But then it talks about him being there. And so it doesn't necessarily seem to be chronological. Is that accurate? Is it is it a chronological description of the Exodus or is it more something else? Yeah, Um the the broader narrative clearly is chronological. I mean, there's chronological progression. Things happen. People die. Aaron dies and is buried, etc. Moses dies, succeeded by Joshua. So there's there's certainly a sequence of events there. They move from Exodus out to Mount Sinai, from Sinai to the land of Israel. But what you're describing there, Michael, is a phenomena that uh, scholars call dischronologization, okay. um, which is which is a, uh, the phenomena where in, um, in telling a story, sometimes things are uh, rearranged in a yeah. in a, a different order than than strict chronology. Um, Dischronologization is is uh, actually a frequent technique in modern modern storytelling. Mm -hmm. Actually, in movies, a lot of movies are based on you know dischronologization. Time travel movies, you know, Back to the Future. Um, inception, you know, which is kind of, you know, you're moving through different layers of reality where different events are, are, uh, have happened already or haven't, you know? So actually dischronologization is, is, a is a common technique in human storytelling from ancient times all the way to the present in the form of flashbacks and so on. So, um, you know, e even, so I'm open. I'd have to look at what what Dr. Michael Heiser, what, what he's claiming there, you know, what instances we'd have to look at those and say whether those are indeed cases. But, you know, already in ancient, uh, very ancient Jewish interpretations of Exodus, um, it was suggested that the laws in Exodus chapters 21 through 23 uh, were actually delivered earlier around the time of Exodus 15 where it actually mentions uh, the um, the people of Israel stopping uh, by the springs of Elim and that uh, Moses gave them some laws there, but it doesn't enumerate what the laws were. Hmm. Then later we have this body of legislation in Exodus 21, 23. So an ancient Jewish approach to that was, oh yeah, these laws in 21 through 23 were actually given, these are the laws that are mentioned in Exodus 15. They're placed after though they're placed after the ten commandments however in order to stress the foundational nature of the ten commandments like we don't want to talk about any law before we talk about the revelation of the ten words at sinai and so that that was dischronologized to show that it was less significant than god's you know great ten words so th that's it's actually not a new thing you find this in ancient jewish and christian tradition <coughs> that there's open they're open to a certain amount of dischronologization for for different reasons but uh but not to the point of saying oh yeah the whole the whole narrative is just is nothing but a jumble of of random events certainly not there there's a there's a progression that takes place and um and you know we're, we're talking about a historical narrative you know, this concept of dyschronology helps explain some things that we see even in the Gospels. I mean, I think of yeah. Jesus cleansing the temple. Well, either he did it twice or the, right. the authors of the Gospel are just simply engaging in this concept because you can certainly see him cleansing the temple at what seems to be different times chronologically. Yeah. Yeah. On, on that particular issue, I actually think Jesus... <laughs> cleanse the temple every time he came to Jerusalem. Maybe. And when he would leave, the roaches came back. <laughs> ah, <laughs> he had to clean them out again. I'm open to <laughs> but, uh, it. I'm open to but, it. Uh, but, but yeah, on other, on other instances, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it, you know, I, going back, actually, you know, some of the earlier, some of the earliest of the fathers, I, I can't, I'd have to look at the reference. So I believe it's Papias, um, talks about Mark writing down the preaching of Peter, but not in order. You know, huh. so that's, that's kind of interesting, you know, so yeah. even among the very early fathers, there was a recognition in that um, there was some, again, dyschronologization in the gospel narratives. Matthew seems to organize things oftentimes thematically. And so I think it would be reasonable to to hold the position that some of the material in Matthew is is organized by theme more than strictly by what what time it took place in uh, in Jesus's career. But um, yeah, it, it, it's a phenomena in different parts of uh, different parts of the Bible.
<laughs> Papias, there's a church father name I haven't heard in a long time. Now, now I need to go back and reread him because I completely <laughs> forgot all about that there with Mark. But OK, yeah. let, let me ask you about maybe uh, something with numbers here very briefly. Um, one thing that we see there is just very large numbers, right? Numbers right. and numbers. Um, and it seems like there's a very large people who are coming out of Egypt that are enumerated there in this book. Um, but some people have pushed back and said, well, that doesn't make sense. If these numbers are actually literal, if there's that many people coming out of Egypt, I mean, there would be some kind of evidence of this, and we just don't see that. And um, others have suggested, well, some of the Hebrew words that describe these numbers could actually be um, represent dozens rather than thousands. Uh, what's your position there? Are those numbers literal? Where, was there a large amount of people who came out right. of Exodus? Yeah. Yeah, I don't have the definitive answer on this, and there's you know a wide number of uh, positions are argued. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, what I say is, I'm open to the numbers being literal. I'm open. You know, it's not like God can't provide for six hundred thousand men plus women and children. Um, it could be that our historical reconstructions are wrong, and that the populations back there back then were much larger. Um, at the same time. The, the issue is that in, in the Hebrew language, um, the term for thousand, elef, uh, is, is an ambiguous term that can also be used to uh, refer to uh, a leader, like a, like a centurion kind of figure, mm -hmm. a, a leader of a, a thousand, and can be used sometimes as a, um, a designation of a military unit, like a platoon or a squad um that doesn't have an exact number of persons associated with it mm -hmm. so there's been a number of rec uh, of articles that have been written on what's called the problem of large numbers in the exodus account and uh, scholars have offered different schema to reinterpret the term thousand in terms of the concept of a unit so if it says that there were uh, 6,000 Levites, it may have originally just meant six military units of Levites, and then those units might have been composed of a lesser uh, number of people. And so these, these, recon these reconstructions come out by interpreting the, the numerical data that were provided in Exodus and Numbers, and you come down to a smaller group, a very, still a large and significant group, but we're talking in an order more like 10 to 20,000, okay, Israelites coming out, which seems more in keeping with the um, our population estimates for the ancient Near East in this time period. So again, different, different models or paradigms for how to reinterpret those figures, um, taking into account the, uh, the term LF, not as a literal thousand, but as a as a military unit that was composed of a smaller number. And it, it gives you these different uh, uh, approximations that seem to fit. So I, I'm open to that possibility as well. That, that may have been the case. And then in the textual transmission of the Bible, at some point the, the term may have been misinterpreted in a strictly literal sense. And then you get these inflated numbers. Yeah, very, very helpful. Thank you for uh, clearing that up. Let me talk uh, about the Pentateuch just a little bit more broadly here. Um, can you maybe talk about Mosaic authorship? Is there evidence that Moses is the author? And can you also discuss that in light of what some argue with the documentary hypothesis? And if you could explain right. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's too much to, it's, you know, I can't prove Mosaic authorship in some kind of like scientific historical sense um uh we need you know much more it's difficult to do that for any to any ancient document you know mm -hmm. so you'd have to have a, a level of evidence that you know is probably not available because it's all been uh destroyed mm -hmm. uh what i can do is provide evidence that would push the date of the pentateuch at least back into the pre-monarchic period mm -hmm. and one of the major uh, one of the major pieces of evidence for that is nothing in the Pentateuch reflects um, the history or the theological development of the people of Israel um, from, the, from the time of David on. Okay, from the time of David on, uh, 
uh, you have the rise of Jerusalem as the sacred capital of the people of Israel, and the, you have the rise of what we call Zion theology, which is, um, you know, a set of expectations that are all gathered around the sacred site of the holy city, Jerusalem, the sacred temple, and the sacred king, who is the descendant of David, the son of David. And of course, that's, you know, that's the matrix that Jesus comes to fulfill. You know, the, the New Testament is emphatic that Jesus is the son of David and that his temple, that his body is the temple, John 2, 21, you know, and he, he gathers around himself the new Jerusalem, which is the church, you know, so the, the whole message of the new covenant of the gospels is based on that, you know, Zion theology. Well, you just don't find that anywhere in the Pentateuch, okay? Um, in fact, the, the city Jerusalem, uh, the term Zion, uh, the word temple never occur anywhere in the Pentateuch. And what that tells us is that the Pentateuch was not edited from the time of David on. Um, because there's, there's wonderful places in the Pentateuch where you could make a few editorial comments that would just elicit the connection of the text with Jerusalem. For example, Jerusalem is mentioned in Genesis 14, but using an archaic name for it, the name Salem. You know, so uh, anybody editing the Pentateuch from the time of David on would surely have gone in there and added just a little clarifying gloss, very justifiable and saying, well, this is this is Jerusalem, you know, so that later readers could understand. Likewise, the place where Abraham sacrificed Isaac in Genesis 22 is in, indeed the place where the temple was later built. But there's no indication in the text of Genesis 22 of that direct connection with the Jerusalem temple. And again, a very justifiable little editorial gloss could have been put in to help explain that to later readers, but you see nothing of the kind. And what that tells me is that the Pentateuch essentially reached its final form before Jerusalem became so significant in the history of the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is why you don't even have these, these uh, very justifiable editorial comments to help, you know, help the reader see where it played significantly in those earlier times. So I say that, that line of evidence points to the fact of having a completed uh, Pentateuch before the rise of the Davidic monarchy. Um, and so that puts you at least into the period of, say, you know, the judges, you know. OK, so you can get back that far. Now, as as far as Moses goes, the Bible itself insists that the laws that that make up the central body of the Pentateuch, you know, especially Exodus through Numbers and well, then Deuteronomy as well, are revelations that God gave to Moses. And uh, that that is um, taken in its plain sense by our Lord himself. OK, Jesus refers frequently to Moses and says, if you don't believe Moses's words, you're not going to believe mine. Um, <laughs> because Moses wrote of me, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, okay? So I follow the lead of the God-man. If the God-man understood Moses to be a real human being who wrote laws for the people of Israel, that's the way I take it. And if that's wrong, then Jesus himself can tell me when I get to heaven, okay? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take his word on this. Is it historically implausible? I don't think so at all. OK, why is it historically plausible for a person who's raised in a royal palace to be able to read and write and to write laws? Plato did it. You know, Plato wrote two works, The Republic and The Laws. Both of them were kind of um, laws for a future perfect society, kind of what you might call utopian legal literature. Um, so this can be done in the ancient world. It was done in the ancient world. Why could Moses not write laws down for an ideal society for the people of Israel that he foresees uh, in the future? So I hold that the legal portions of the Pentateuch that the scriptures themselves describe as being revealed by God to Moses on Sinai and preached by Moses on the plains of Moab in the case of Deuteronomy, that this is material that comes from Moses. And I would imagine, you know, as far as the book of Genesis, there's no explicit claim in the Bible itself that Moses wrote that, although it's not unreasonable to hold that Moses wrote down a kind of canonical version of the origin narrative of the people of Israel to serve as a preface for the laws that he communicated to the people of Israel. 
And we do have some circumstantial evidence which connects the Pentateuchal material with that time period of Moses. For example, the book of Deuteronomy, which of all the books of the Pentateuch is kind of quintessentially the book of Moses, uh, because in Deuteronomy, Moses himself is promulgating law rather than merely taking it down by dictation from God on, on Sinai. So the book of Deuteronomy has long been noted by scholars as bearing a striking resemblance to the Hittite vassal treaties or covenant treaties that we have from the second millennium BC. And uh, they follow the, the same kind of order of arrangement of like a historical prologue and then major laws followed by minor laws, followed by instructions for the uh, for the storage and the periodic reading of the covenant document and so on. And um, I do not believe that there would be this uh, uh, pleasing or elegant correspondence between the literary structure of the book of Deuteronomy and these Hittite vassal treaties that we've recovered from the second millennium uh, BC, unless they were written contemporaneously. You know, and, and if you think about what the Bible says about Moses, it says that he was raised in the Egyptian court, which presumably would be New Kingdom Egypt. And we know that New Kingdom Egypt had extensive correspondence be with, with the Hittites. And we, act, in fact, have treaties between uh, the pharaohs and the Hittite emperors. And so if Moses is trained in the royal court and he's reading this legal literature, this kind of uh, governmental correspondence, then he would be precisely the sort of person who could reproduce these kind of legal forms when he's legislating for the people of Israel. So that's a, that's a view um, uh, that, that I would adopt. Well, I, I may be butchering the argument of the opposition here, but I, I think I heard something along the lines that um, the prophets don't seem to quote directly from the Pentateuch and thus um it was something that was written much later i i, I think that was the argument have can you maybe address yeah. that yeah. right yeah that's a claim that that that's at the basis of the documentary hypothesis uh -huh. mm -hmm. so that was that was the, the great innovation that julius wellhausen introduced into uh biblical scholarship he tried to complain he, tr he tried to propose the idea that the prophets came first and then the law was written after the prophets. So prophets before the law, very famous dictum. He himself had to walk that back in a number of instances because it's just not possible that all of the prophets wrote before all of the law and he ended up having to walk back, okay, the 10 commandments and different you know, portions of it. You know, So actually his view ends up as being more nuanced by that. Mm. But Michael, what you just raised is actually an area on, on which I've done a lot of my own scholarly publication. Okay. I have a number of publications uh, working primarily on the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah mm -hmm. and doing high resolution comparison between their oracles and the texts of the books of Moses okay. and, and demonstrating that if you're analyzing for the direction of literary dependence, basically who's borrowing from whom. You just cannot maintain that the books of Moses are quoting from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. It doesn't work under high resolution analysis. Hmm. When you really carefully go line by line, word by word, the only direction of dependence that makes sense is for Jeremiah and Ezekiel to be quoting from the books of Moses. One of the, one of the strongest lines of evidence is, of this is that um, the the language, the, the cultic language from Exodus through Numbers is kind of distinctive. There's a lot of cultic legislation in there or like liturgical legislation. And then kind of the, the, the homiletical language of, of Moses preaching in the book of Deuteronomy has a kind of distinctive diction to it or distinctive style. Yet in the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, you'll often find uh, lines or quotations from, say, Leviticus juxtaposed adjacent with quotations of distinctive vocabulary taken from Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's called conflation, where you're grabbing from early in the books of Moses and late from the books of Moses, and then you're composing, you know, a, a new composition that's that's mixing the two. And um, 
that that phenomena of conflation is widely regarded by scholars as the telltale sign of the borrowing text okay the borrowing text will grab from different places within a source text and mix them together hmm. the, the the problem then is if you hold that say leviticus and deuteronomy were written after jeremiah and ezekiel how did they untangle okay how did they untangle uh, these mixed quotations such that Deuteronomy only ta ever takes the Deuteronomy material, so to speak, out of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and Leviticus mm -hmm. only ever takes the Leviticus material out, you know, and it, it just doesn't work. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the, this, uh, that, that idea of the law being written after the prophets cannot be maintained anymore. And I, I don't think that people seriously working on the prophets uh, hold to that, you know. Um, Wellhausen was simply wrong, and that's one of the major things that's wrong with the documentary hypothesis. That's that's very helpful because I always hear people speak of it as if it's gospel truth. And by the way, I, di I didn't know you did any work here uh, with the prophets in this particular area. That's interesting. Right. I mean, just oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I've got a new book called Murmuring Against Moses: The Contentious Past and Contested Future of Pentateuchal Studies. And uh, the, the three middle chapters of the book I wrote, it's co-written with my, my friend, Dr. Jeffrey Morrow. And the three chapters in the center of the book that, that I wrote, uh, two of them are actually devoted to this um, a careful analysis of, uh, well, I should say, at least one of the chapters is, is devoted to careful analysis of the relationship between, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Mosaic books and, uh, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel in particular, other prophets as well, but especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Completely random question that just came to mind here since since we're on it. But um, you you look at something like Jeremiah four four that talks about the circumcision of the heart. Um, right. Is is there any kind of evidence for lit literary dependence of Jeremiah um, based on the Pentateuch in that portion of of Jeremiah? Well, oh, absolutely, because you get the circumcision of the heart uh, mentioned um, uh, by Moses. Uh, twice in uh, Deuteronomy 10, 16, and again in chapter 30, verse 6, uh, where Moses says, circumcise, therefore, the foreskins of your heart, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. that concept of the circumcision of the heart, Jeremiah is clearly getting from Moses. Mm -hmm. And um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah has so many literary parallels to Deuteronomy that some German scholars of the 19th century actually proposed that Jeremiah wrote Deuteronomy. Um, but that that can't be maintained because Deuteronomy is written in an older Hebrew form of Hebrew than the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is written in a sixth century Hebrew and shows some li linguistic development from the more classical Hebrew of uh, of Deuteronomy. And there's a lot of uh, another thing is it's not just Deuteronomy that Jeremiah uses, but he has a lot of parallels with the. The earlier books that are often called, you know, often described as the priestly source or priestly mm -hmm. material, mm -hmm. which is basically the cultic le legislation of Exodus through Numbers. You do find a lot of allusions and literary borrowing of that also in uh, in Jeremiah. So, um, but yeah, absolutely. Jeremiah is constantly uh, in conversation with um, the books of Moses and, and Ezekiel uh, even more so. I would imagine there's also some difficulty if maybe Jeremiah allegedly wrote Deuteronomy, there would be some difficulties because Deut Deuteronomy would talk about cultural things that by the time of Jeremiah, he just yeah. would not have been aware of since they didn't, you know, focus on archaeology like we do. So it yeah. just would be entirely anachronistic. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. The, 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 the nations that are listed as threats to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy were largely extinct by the time of Jeremiah. So there's all kinds of things in, in Deuteronomy that would be, uh, anachronistic in um, in the sixth century, and uh, and and uh, on the other hand, you would expect if Jeremiah had written Deuteronomy that uh, there would be references to uh, sixth century realia in the book of Deuteronomy that are that are absent from it. We're right at the one hour mark. How are you doing on time? 
I do have to go pretty quick uh, for okay. another meeting. So, okay, yeah. well, let's just go ahead and uh, wrap it up here. I'll ask you just one final question. Maybe I can get you back on another. Yes, time, but, definitely. Um, you know, one final question here. What What about difficulties in the Old Testament where it looks like there's conflict and maybe the numbers that are presented? Saul reigned this many years and something else says he reigned that many years. Or, you, you know, what what do we do with that? Yeah, oftentimes those those are uh, textual errors, um, and um, you know this. The, Saint Augustine recognized this. He said, you know, when I when I find an error in scripture, um, you know, it, Augustine goes on to list a number of different uh, steps that he takes. Uh, but one of the th one of the things that that Augustine immediately asks is, perhaps it's an error of the transmission of the text. So we have a an error in the copy. And uh, when we have differences like in the in the uh, number of years that a certain king reigned, you know, for example, mm -hmm. like between Kings and Chronicles, um, those those differences between, say, 22 and 42 or between two and 22 or something like that, that can be just a, uh, you know, a stroke of a pen mm -hmm. in Hebrew. <coughs> An incidental stroke can throw it off <coughs> by, you know, by 10 or 20 years or something like this. And so um, you, you get those you get those variations, and, and so we'd have to look at particular instances and 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 ask ourselves. But I would say, largely, those differences are are coming down to copyist errors in our ancient manuscripts. We can't always can't always determine which of the which of the manuscripts is an error. Is it the manuscript of Kings or is it the manuscript of Chronicles? But uh, probably one of them has made a slip of the pen. Um, <clears throat> Another thing is you get inflated figures <clears throat> for, uh, say, monetary values in the book of Chronicles when you compare those same figures in the book of Kings. And I think what's going on there is that the author of Chronicles is giving um, uh, the equivalent in his own day. He's writing a couple centuries after the book of Kings when um, the currency had been significantly devalued, you know, by the by the introduction of alloys and so and they, they basically debased their currency so all the prices went up mm -hmm. and uh, the chronicler you know gives you you know the equivalent in his own day of uh what had been a, a smaller you know monetary number um in um in the books of kings could there also be later redactors too who maybe change the names of cities or something like that and that might account for anachronisms and Right, you do you do get that, like in in uh, you know it's the the mentioning the mention of the city Ramses, for example, um, as being built by the uh, the Hebrew slaves in the early chapters of Exodus. That's often trotted out as an anachronism and say, well, you know, the city of Ramses wasn't around in the theoretical time for the period of the ex uh, the Exodus. But Ramses is is uh, the name of the city as it was well known later. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, what you have there is just like when you talk about the early history of New York, you don't call it New Amsterdam, right. which is what it originally was called, <laughs> sure. you know. Yeah. And you don't refer to the history of Houston as Harrisburg. It was, you know, Houston was called Harrisburg until 1926. Okay. Well, nobody's going to understand that if you're writing about the history of that you're going to call it by what it's known today, you know. So um, you, you get that kind of updating where, um, in various places in the Bible, um, places and persons are sometimes referred to by the names by which they were more popularly known in a later era mm -hmm. in order in order to be understandable for uh, later generations. And just to be clear, none of these difficulties touch on the question of inspiration. Yes, that's correct. You know, yeah, that's helpful. I'd love to get you back on sometime. I have just so many more questions, but hey, put in a plug. I mean, we already mentioned the Old Testament uh, introduction book that you did and also Murmurings Against Moses. Any Anything else you want to make the viewers aware of? Sure. Just came out with another stick figure book in my basic series with Ave Maria Press uh, called Love Basics for Catholics that follows the theme of uh, marriage from Genesis through Revelation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, our, our viewers may want to check that out and, um, 
Uh, also have a, a book on priesthood in scripture, which is relevant not just for those in holy orders, but for lay people as well, because I touched a lot about the priesthood of the faithful, what we call the mm -hmm. common priesthood. And that's called uh, Jesus and the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood. That's available from Emmaus Road Publishing uh, right here in uh, Steubenville. So, yep, uh, we're, we're still put, pumping stuff out. So check it out. It's all good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. I want to get you back on. Okay. We'll, we'll do that, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. Everybody hit the like button and the subscribe button. We'll see you later.